Remember the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers? Sure, we all do. Well, you're three years old, so no, no you don't. But what if I told you that there was a season of the Super Sentai series that got released only in Japan? And to top it all off, there was a Famicom title that only came out in Japan. Play the intro already. No, I don't want to play Choo Choo Rocket. You're not getting me with that one again. Cats. Though we've talked extensively about the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers in Season 2 of this show, we've never tackled any of the variations of the Japanese show that it's based on, the Super Sentai series. You're right. Clowns are creepy. But let's show them some footage so that way we stay slightly on topic, okay? One year before Kyoru Sentai Zio Ranger became what we now know outside of Japan as Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the 15th entry of the Super Sentai series debuted in its motherland. Chojin Sentai Jetman ran for 51 episodes from 1991 until 1992. As a fan of Power Rangers, the show struck a chord with me for its more adult feel. There was smoking and drinking and love triangles, oh my! The show takes place in an undisclosed year of the 1990s, where a defense team known as Sky Force has scientists that develop special abilities known as the Burdonic Waves? Yeah, I don't know either. Transforming the five Sky Force members into Jetman. After a series of tragedies are thrown down on Sky Force by an evil organization known as the Virem, the Jetman team officially forms to fight this threat to humanity. There's love, loss, betrayal, an awesome Japanese live action full of spandex wearing humans with wacky powers. And giant robots! What's not to love? But where do video games fit in all this? Well, how about a Famicom exclusive title? Chojin Sentai Jetman was released in late 1991. It was developed by Natsume and published by a subset company of Bandai known as Angel. So it was late in the Famicom's life cycle. By that time, the Super Famicom was already out for close to a year, so gamers in the East may have missed out on what could easily be considered one of the best Famicom or Nintendo Entertainment System games that were based on the Super Sentai series. We open to an action-packed intro which shows off our Jetman and their respective swords, called Mecha in this series, joining them in battle. Or is it Jetman? Jet people? I don't know, let's just call them bird dudes and bird dudettes. Ooh, even better! Boods and birdettes! 
We then see the mecha begin to combine Voltron style into the Great Icarus, which is comprised of their five mecha into Jet Icarus, and paired with their second ship, an alien created spaceship called Jet Garuda, but more on this beast later. The title screen allows players to choose between the main adventure or battle mode. Battle mode is essentially a way to try out the mecha fights that take place at the end of each level. The main adventure involves a total of five areas to choose from, similar to other Natsume standouts like Shatterhand. You choose from the five playable characters, which all have varying qualities that aren't too drastically different, but still remain similar enough to be considered an engaging team of heroes. Each character controls fluidly with the directional pad, while you can jump with the A button. For your B button, you will either have a ranged blaster shot, a sword, or a melee attack weapon. Pressing up and B allows your chosen character to do a more powerful close quarters kick, which adds a bit of variety to the gameplay and can get you out of tougher situations if enemies get too close. You have your choice between the leader, Red Hawk, also known as Ryu Tendo, and his bringer sword, the rich heiress, Kaori Roku Meikan who is the White Swan and uses her Bird Blaster, the Black Condor and loner of the group, Guy Yuki, and his Bringer Sword, future idol pop star Eiko Hayasaka, who is known as the Blue Swallow, and her Bird Blaster, or nature lover and cooking fan, Rayata Oishi, better known as the Yellow Owl and his... Wing Gauntret? Wing Gauntret? Really? You're gonna go through the trouble of translating the game into English and having barely any Japanese hiragana, katakana, or kanji, but you're gonna misspell gauntlet? Well, at least the game's pretty much all in English. Or in this case, English. The game is easy enough to play in the US, with a Honey Bee or Famicom to NES adapter, and a top-loading Nintendo. The cart is reasonably priced- WHAT?! IT'S $55?! I swear I bought the game for 10 bucks three years ago! <sighs> the trials and tribulations of video game collecting. There are reproduction cards that do exist, and for a lesser price you can even get a bootleg- Nope, nope, not even going near that one again! While most of the locations you'll play through in this game seem less than memorable, you'll have a great time bashing through enemies pretty quickly. In fact, the stages don't get that hard until later in the game. After beating the fifth area, you'll be allowed to take on a sixth and final location. Enemies are mostly 1-2 to two hit kills, depending on which weapon you use. Some attacks are more powerful than others, and while the control is tight, the game feels like it's missing something. There's a Jetman logo you can collect to use with the start button, which will wipe out all the enemies. This can prove useful in tight jams when you're feeling claustrophobic during fights, though this rarely happens. I think my biggest hang-up is that the enemies are easily spotted, which gives you a large amount of reaction time, leaving plenty of room for you to attack. Though the game's difficulty suffers, it doesn't mean you won't enjoy playing the game. It's just going to be a romp for seasoned veterans of much harder titles. If you need a comparison to other Natsume works, think Ghost Sweeper Makame instead of Shadow of the Ninja. Strange enough, the boss battles are the most difficult part of the game. When you reach the end of a level, a monster or enemy will appear, causing your mechas to join forces. This is where that practice with battle mode comes in handy. Essentially, you're playing a digital version of Rock'em Sock'em Robots where you control your mecha. You can jump and attack in addition to blocking shots, but the main goal is to get as close as you can to the enemy to throw in some well-timed punches. There's a power meter at the bottom of the screen, and when you land enough punches, you can fill it and pull off a devastating attack that can save you from destruction. Now, even if you don't fill the bar up all the way, there are little moves that you can do here and there, so keep trying. The bosses are relentless, and it's very easy to be defeated without the proper timing. And if you die at the boss, you have to return to the beginning of the stage, so the game isn't completely without challenge. There's an almost rhythmic method to learning each boss, which kept things fresh and entertaining. The graphics are middle of the road for the console that it was on and the time that it was released. This is probably the biggest shock, as there were plenty of games that came out before it that looked better than what we have here. Your Jetman characters and the enemies they fight aren't full of enough detail, and backgrounds are often very flat looking and desolate, with a lack of special effects and polish. It's certainly not an ugly game by any means, but it doesn't make any efforts to visually grab the player. However, the real sensory hero here is the soundtrack. 
composed by Hiroyuki Iwatsuki, with sound driver support by my favorite composer Ikumizu Tani, Jojin Sentai Jetman has a soundtrack that will keep you coming back for more. Prepare to rock out to some of the finest songs barely heard on the NES. Almost every single track is full of fantastic Japanese action game music, throbbing bass lines, pounding drums, and uplifting melodies that keep your blood pumping while you slay the bad guys. It's a classic Natsume soundtrack that deserves to be heard by all retro video game music enthusiasts. Chojin Sentai Jetman was a worthwhile effort to keep the Famicom alive, and while we never saw this game's release outside of Japan, it's absolutely a game that requires importing. Thanks to an almost entirely English translation provided by the developers, you won't be lost when it comes to story because, well, there isn't any. What we have here is an action title that can be beat in about an hour that is lower on the difficulty, but soaring in the fun factor. Between an astounding soundtrack and tight play control, it's definitely a hidden gem of an import worth bringing to your Nintendo Entertainment System. And the best part is, you'll want to return to it over and over again. Man, this was such a good game. That's it. I tire of you. Harley, send him to the future or something. I've got some choo-choo rocket to play. Hmm. Whoa, what's happening? Hey guys, thanks for watching the show. On the left, you have the Ghost Sweeper Makame episode from last season, as we mentioned earlier in this episode. And you also have on the right-hand side, the first part of a two-part series of the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers games on the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. Check out both of those reviews if you like this one. And once again, thanks for watching.